All righty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the midweek program here at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. My name is Blake. I'm the education assistant here at the Arboretum. Today we are under the awning in the visitor center. Well, we were we were set up in the flowering lawn, showing off a whole bunch of one showing off the flowering lawn, which has lots of clover in it and a juga in it and other species that can be rather weedy. Um, and the reason for that is because today we have Joe Neal on our program, who is a weed scientist from NC State, and we are going to be talking with him all about weeds. So it is rather unfortunate that we're here under the awning without weeds present, but we actually happen to have a huge wheelbarrow full of weeds to talk about. So that's, that's just wonderful. Okay. And with the announcements out of the way, I'd like to pass things over to Greg and Joe Neal to do a little garden conversation about weeds. Hey y'all, uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, Want to introduce my new friend, uh, Mr. Neal. Um, it's, it's funny, he's gonna talk about his book here in a minute. And um, I actually have this book and didn't put two and two together um, until yesterday we were talking about um, him writing lots of books. It was like, I got home, um, it's on my bookshelf, I was like, that's the book that he wrote. So we're super excited to have him here. Um, part of my mission being here at the Arboretum, um, part of my evil plan is to do a lot more interactions with our, our university um, brethren because of the breadth of knowledge and it's just kind of a natural thing to do. And also kind of in the mission of, of the J.C. Ross and Arboretum to, to do some of that kind of stuff. So I'm super excited to have him here. Um, we're gonna kind of keep it loose and, and easy and this is a topic that Sophia, our nursery manager, um, initially said we should talk about because um, we do a lot of weeding here, as you can see next to me. Um, it's, it's something that gives us job security on a, on a regular basis. It's something that I personally have spent years of my life on. If you looked at it chronologically for my horticultural career, um, I don't like weeds, but there's something very cathartic about weeding and being in the garden and being connected to the garden. Um, that, that excuse and that flowery description lasts till about July when it becomes absolutely horrible and tedious and uh, you're, you're ready to, 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 to jump off the bridge. But what we wanted to do is, is talk about um, uh, just, just weeds in general, different types, uh, some control sorts of things. But I wanna kick off with um, what I think is the definition of a weed. And um, that kind of varies from gardener to gardener. Uh, you know, weed is a plant that's in a cultivated landscape that, that shouldn't be there. And that could be any number of things. It could be this whole host of things that's next to me, and we'll talk about this in just a second. Um, somebody, I had a professor at Virginia Tech that said, if you had corn plants in your rose garden, that corn could be considered a weed. Is corn a, a weed by definition? No, but it's an unwanted plant kind of in that environment. So that's kind of my personal definition of weeds. Um, so with that, um, let's, let's talk about some stuff. And I'll just follow up. That personal definition is about as good a definition as you'll ever get for a weed because it's it's truly just a uh, you know a man-made phenomena. You know the plant, all plants are perfectly fine when they're growing in their native habitat. It's just when when we uh, either move them to another habitat or they move into one of our managed habitats, whether that's a corn field, a soybean field, your uh, a, a aquatic uh, reservoir, lakes, streams, uh, you know, or our gardens. If, the, if you don't want the plant there, it is by definition a weed. Yep. Um, and we, you know, we've got, you know, as many types of plants as there are uh, in the world in terms of life cycles and ways of reproduction and growth habits, uh, pretty much they can all become weeds in the right in the, when they find the right place. You know, some are more prolific than others though. <laughs> and uh, and I, I will digress just a moment. You know, I, I reflect at times like this um, you know, on why did I choose weed <laughs> science? Um, well, our high school guidance counselor had that top on their list of career opportunities. No, they did not. Uh, it is something that uh, all weed scientists, you know, came to in graduate school as a recognition of, of a need. Yeah. 
You know, uh, gardeners, farmers, uh, land managers need to manage weeds and invasive species for producing crops, for maintaining landscapes, for uh, maintaining habitats. And, you know, once you, you see uh, a need that you can help serve and help resolve, then it becomes a very rewarding career. But I, I do reflect back to uh, my first job in a nursery as a 13-year-old uh, boy. I got a job at a local nursery. You can imagine what my first job was. Hand weeding. And if you see all this gray hair on the screen, that was before we had herbicides for use in nurseries. And I had read an article in American Nurseryman Magazine about this revolutionary new thing called Treflan that they were testing that prevented weeds. And this 13 year old boy pulling weeds, you know, in the summer in Southwest Georgia, Oof. you know, I remember thinking, you know, if I ever have a nursery, I'm going to use that Treflan stuff because, because without, without a weed management plan, without proper tools, then, you know, the, the weeds are just going to, uh, going to take over. So I'm glad to be here, uh, to talk about weeds and, yeah. um, you know, and so I think we, we had talked about, uh, you know, just sort of beginning with what are you encountering? What are you, what are you as a gardener encountering in your gardens right now? And I know in my yard, I've got a lot of weeds, you know, the, the, it's kind of like the, uh, the cobbler's, you know, children have no shoes. The my house, yard. The house painter's house that needs to be painted. Yeah, yeah. And my yard is full of weeds. Yeah. Um, it's a photo op for me. So I have... Um, There's a threshold of tolerance, too. There's a threshold? We, we have a higher threshold of tolerance. Uh, no, I have a very high threshold at home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Like I said, it's a photo op. Right. Um, but what's coming up now, uh, are uh, you can see almost every life cycle emerging right now. The winter annual weeds. And again, you know, as I said, weeds come in all growth uh, forms and life cycles, but we we lump them into broad categories of annuals, you know, biennials, perennials. But within the annuals, particularly in the weed science uh, arena, we talk about winter annuals and summer annuals. So the you know the winter annuals germinate when the soil is really cool. So they're germinating in the fall. They're germinating here in North Carolina. They're germinating in the winter. Yep. They're germinating in early spring, and they're growing now and, and starting to flower. I mean, real common ones uh, that most people are familiar with, henbit. You know, beautiful flowers. I remember collecting a bouquet of those for my mom when I was a kid. <laughs> my dad was just thrilled with that. Uh, uh, but uh, to me, they were beautiful flowers at the time. Now I'm battling them in my own yard for, you know, and, I, and I'm not hand weeding them. I'm taking pictures of them actually. But uh, so those winter annuals, they germinated in the cool part of the year. Now they're maturing, they're producing flowers, they're producing seed, they're dropping those seed. And those seed are gonna remain dormant in the soil through summer and be ready to germinate next fall. So one of the things as a gardener you want to think about is, is if you have these weeds and this pile of weeds here in this cart are, are mostly winter annual weeds. So getting them out of the garden now and, and getting them into, you could put them in your compost. I get that question a lot. What do I yeah. do with all the weeds that I pulled? Yeah. So put them in the compost. If you're composting uh, properly, then those weed seeds are heat. going, yeah, yeah, right. The, you get the heat, but you also get germination of a lot of those seeds, and then you turn the compost, and that kills even more. Uh, yeah, it, so, inter it interrupts the life cycle. Yeah. It's a, an easy cultural thing to do. Right, and so that, that's a question I get a lot of times is, can I, can I put my weeds in the compost? Yes, as long as you, you're doing a good job composting, get the heat, uh, generated. Uh, the heat will kill the weed seeds, the, the other seeds that 
are not killed will germinate, and then by turning it, you, you kill those seedlings. Um, but I digress. Uh, those plants are going to seed right now. You want to get them out of the garden before they drop their seed because a big part of, annual, of managing annual weeds is to manage the seed bank. Reduce the amount of seed that are there and you reduce the number of weeds you've got to deal with next year. And so winter annuals, they're finishing their life cycle now, but it's not too late to do something about them. But we also see summer weeds are starting to come up, right? Uh, and we can get, you know, in the, uh, in the fields uh, behind the Arboretum where we have a research facility, uh, we've got pigweed and lamb's quarters and crabgrass germinating. So these summer weeds, the plants we normally associate with, you know, June, you know, late May and June, they're already germinating. Uh, and so right now, you know, we're, we're dealing with both those winter annuals finishing their life cycle, the summer annuals beginning their life cycle, um, and we're dealing with perennials that are starting to sprout and grow. You know, so well, one uh, real, you know, common perennial that we uh, gardeners deal with is nut sedge. Uh, I've heard a number of people over the years call it nut grass. One thing in, in the weed community, we want to emphasize that it is indeed nut sedge. It's not a grass. And so when you think about controlling it and you look at control options for grasses, you need to remember it's not going to be effective mm -hmm. on the sedges most of the time. So um, nut sedge is a perennial it reproduces by a tuber. So it has an, what we would consider an annual life cycle, okay? It has an annual life cycle where it's gonna come up from a tuber and what you're looking at there is the rhizome that it produces. At the tips of the rhizome, starting in early summer, they'll start to form tubers, okay? But these, the plant will die back to the ground, it'll die back to and leave the tubers over the winter. And then every spring and summer, those tubers sprout. And, and it'll produce one mother plant, and then that mother plant starts producing rhizomes that then spread. So it's real important with the, the, a perennial like this to control this weed before it has a chance to produce all of those daughter plants and producing these rhizomes. So, um, so with a perennial like nut sedge, you want to get on it as soon as you see those plants coming up. Whether you're going to use uh, herbicides to control it or you're going to use hand weeding or, or digging uh, or hoeing, you want to get on it right away and don't let it establish and spread because it's obviously producing those rhizomes already. Yeah, so, so perennials, uh, are often considered the most difficult mm -hmm. to manage because they have these ways of, of spreading underground or, or, or a large underground storage uh, root or crown that makes them, one, you can't pull them up. I, I, I saw a poster one time of, um, uh, that was a, a cartoon of a, a fella trying to pull up a, a a, a seedling, a, tr a little tree seedling. And uh, it was a cutaway showing the, the root system of this tree seedling occupying the entire frame. <laughs> and the, the, the weed was this big and the man trying to pull it up. It's all I, underground. Yeah, I feel that way when I'm trying to pull up uh, oak seedlings out of my landscape bed. Poke, pokeweed is kind of the same. Pokeweed, pokeweed makes a huge crown. Yeah. And you've got to get after that with a shovel. Especially if it's a pokeweed. I've worked in gardens before where people would just cut the top off of it. And next year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And somewhere in my, my pictures uh, for lectures, I've got one that we pulled out and it's eight feet tall. Um, not counting the weed, which is probably four feet long that we literally dug out and air spaded 
with an air spade so we could see the whole entire thing. And it, for years, someone had just cut the top off of it yeah. and it, you know, it was that big around. So you had mentioned something earlier that I, I'm, I'm gonna forget if I don't mention um, in, in helping with controlling seeds and talking about cultural things, but something that we do here a lot, both for the benefit of the plant nutrient wise, but mulching is, is good to kind of help um, give, give the seeds that are down closer to soil a bad day and a harder time to come up through that. So that's something that's really helpful in you know, getting stuff out before it goes to seed making sure the bed's clean and putting down a good layer of mulch. That's part of the method to the madness of, of what mm -hmm. we do here is to an easy cultural thing that you can do to help keep your weeds kind of uh, at least give them bad days and make it harder for them to, to go through the, the stages of their life that, that Joe has mentioned a couple times. Yes, and mulches are, you know, our number one defense against annual weeds um, because most seeds require some light to germinate. Most weed seeds require some light to germinate. It doesn't have to be much, but it, they do require some light. And even if they don't require light to germinate, the young seedlings, you know, after they germ germinate, those little tiny plants need to find light fairly soon. So we consider, you know, mulching is our number one defense against weeds. Mulches are over 90% effective on annual weeds. Yeah. yeah. Now there are a few species that are evolved to grow from much deeper in the soil that do not require light to germinate. You know, so most of those species are going to be fairly large seeded. You think of morning glories. Mm -hmm. Morning glory seeds are, you know, over an eighth of an inch in diameter. And, and they've got a lot of energy stored in that seed. And they can germinate from several inches down in the soil or from, yeah, or from underneath the mulch. So weeds like that are not gonna be controlled by mulch. Our perennial weeds, like our nutsedge, will not be controlled by mulch either. Uh, our Creeping perennial weeds like Bermuda grass, mm. it's a turf, but it's also a terrible landscape weed uh, that reproduces by stolons and rhizomes that can come up from underneath the mulch. And so what you find is by mulching, you're going to control most of your annual weeds, but then what comes in are going to be your perennials and some of your tough to control annuals like morning glory. Um, and again, mulching mm -hmm. and sanitation. Mulching and sanitation, if we always emphasize mulches and sanitation, you're gonna reduce your weed populations. But as one of the growers I worked with one time, he told me, he says, if we ever get behind on our weeding, we don't catch up until next year. Mm. Yeah, it's a constant fear for, for me is to yeah. that fine line of staying right there to mm -hmm. kind of keep things at bay before you have to do, you know, bring other other things and other things into it. Right. And we mentioned the um, pulling the uh, the winter annuals out before they go to seed. That's important for summer weeds as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really important for some some uh, of our weeds that have a, a method for self-dispersal and an ability to have multiple generations a year. Think of your wood sorrels or oxalis, okay? They've got those little uh, rocket-shaped uh, <laughs> seed heads that can forcefully shoot their seeds up to 12 feet away. And those seeds are not dormant when they land, they're ready to germinate again. So there's one here. Yep, there's a good one. It looks like it's all ready to uh, to shed some seed. So when I talk about sanitation, it's not just you know keeping you know pulling the weeds. It's it's doing so you know with some thought. It's like if you've got a uh, you know some pigweed plants coming up, you, you know. I can walk right past those pigweed plants for a week or two. They're not going to seed. But we do have some other plants 
that are able to go to seed very rapidly. You know, spurges, surprisingly, you know, spurges can complete their life cycle very quickly. Uh, they germinate within, you know, if you, you take a seed, put it in the ground, it'll germinate within five days, flowering within 18 days, shedding seed within 28 days. It's less, less than a month from seed to less, seed. Less than a month. That's right. Less than a month from seed to seed. So, you know, is it important to control those, those plants when they're small? Yes. It's real important for some species, but for others like, a, you know, a pigweed or a lamb squatters, you know, they have one shot for the year. They have to grow up. It takes them a month or more to get to where they're going to produce seed. Uh, and so you have a little time to, to remove those. Uh, I was uh, telling Greg about one of the weeds that we did research on that is widespread in landscapes now called mulberry weed, mm -hmm. Fatua villosa. Uh, for, uh, for you Star Trek fans, here's the reference for you. I call this the Tribble of the Plant World. <laughs> And you remember, uh, those of you who saw that episode, The Trouble with Tribbles. We're showing our age. Yeah. But that's okay. <laughs> For the rest of you, We're not these proud. are furry little creatures that just start, were very prolific at reproducing and they fill, basically filled up the, uh, the Starship Enterprise. Literally. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, um, and the captain asks the doctors, you know, Bones, what makes these things tick? And the doctor replied, well, Captain, as near as I can tell, these things are born pregnant. So I think of uh, mulberry weed as the triple of the plant world. Uh, we did some research and found that within 12 days of it reaching the two leaf stage, 12 days from reaching the two leaf stage, it can be shedding seed. Wow. And we're talking about plants that are about a half an inch tall. And those seeds are, are explosively dehiscent. In other words, the seed pod, are, the seeds are shot out of the seed clusters. I think we have some employees that are explosively dehiscent. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe, I think maybe. Yeah. This is a good segue to talk about yeah. some sources, um, yeah. like your book, so, and, and we can talk about the apps too. It's important, you know, sometimes it's important to identify that weed. So you know which ones you really need to be worried about, which ones you don't need to be quite so worried about, right? Um, but sometimes gardeners just want to know. And how do you identify, uh, you know, an unknown plant? Well, there are lots of uh, mobile phone apps out there now that are actually really good mm -hmm. at identifying unknown plants and they're actually pretty good at identifying weeds okay uh, there was a uh, uh, there is a an extension weed scientist at Michigan State University who did a study comparing the accuracy oh, really? of the phone apps huh. for weed identification and uh, what what they reported was pretty good results uh, it, I use um, iNaturalist because I've, I've had it on my phone for quite some time, uh, and I found it to be surprisingly accurate. Picture uh, this is another good one. I've used that one extensively. Picture this was yeah. ranked very highly in yeah. uh, that extension project. In fact, picture this was ranked the highest. Yeah. Uh, the paid version exactly. uh, was, was ranked the highest among the apps they tested. But even the very best ones were only about 80 to 85 percent accurate, it's not which bad. is really good. But here's the good part is even when they were not accurate, they were showing you a, a very similar or closely related species. Right. So then what I recommend is once your app has said it's this species, then go get a reliable plant ID manual and look at the manual and look at the details and say, okay, is it truly that species? Or is it something very similar to that species? And so for weeds, obviously, you know, shameless commerce section of our program, um, very best weed identification guide I've ever written. It's a good one. Right? 
Uh, this is the second edition of Weeds of the Northeast. And so, yes, Weeds of the Northeast. It was written, the first edition was written while I was at Cornell. Uh, it was written for that region. And then the year it came into print, I moved to NC State University. <laughs> um, and that was in 1996. So it's been a while and we just, quite literally just last month, we got this imprint. So uh, it's it, the first edition. Then, I this think. is, yeah. yes. So this, you gotta get the second gotta edition because the second edition covers North Carolina. Uh, it covers the mid-Atlantic states and we had the name changed to, to include the mid-Atlantic yeah. states, right? Uh, and we added about 200 species to this book. It has, um, you know, a description, but a facing page for, for every species that has, you know, multiple photos of the growth habit, identifying characteristics, both the reproductive and vegetative and even seeds. If you, uh, uh, the regulatory agencies like to have these seed photos uh, for, for plant identification. It does, for those uh, amateur botanists who love a dichotomous key, it has one. Um, but it is based on vegetative traits, not the floral traits. And what the, what the key does in this book, the vegetative key does um, or works very similarly to the apps. It narrows your search list to a relatively small number of species and then gives you the page numbers for those species. It doesn't try to get it to the absolute one species. So get it to a, a manageable number, a half a dozen species, and then go look up those half a dozen species in the book and look at the flowers, look at the leaf shapes, look at the, uh, you know, the, 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 the color, look at the size, look at the growth habit, um, and all of these details that are going to confirm the identification. This book also gives you information on how they spread and what its life cycle is too. So you can, if you find this and you identify it, you can look and see, is it an annual? Is it a perennial? Is it spreading by rhizomes? Is it spreading, making tubers? Um, it is not a weed control manual. This is a weed identification manual. So weed control, you have to look at other resources like our extension uh, that's, that's, websites. That's the best place to go. And mm -hmm. we try to steer clear of, of recommending certain chemicals. We'll talk a little bit about some, but and it's, it's, it's also varied by where you live. So different states have different things that you can and, and can't use. A lot of them are fairly close and similar. But if you're somebody from another state, it behooves you to look at you know, what chemicals are are available to control weeds at different stages and the different types of weeds in your particular part of the country. You want to talk yeah. a little bit about uh, control? Yeah, let's, let's talk. Yeah, uh, I know everyone loves their weeds, but most of the time people want to, when they finally talk to me, they want to know how to get rid of it. Well, now, most of our most of our conversations revolve around, you know, a, an herbicide that we could use to control it. But really, as we were talking earlier, weed management starts with sanitation and mulching to prevent those weed seedlings from establishing. Yep. You can even smother a lot of, of perennial weeds with a, with a good mulch layer. Uh, now, it is important to remember that you know, like, like most things, a little bit of mulch is a good thing. Too much mulch is a bad thing. Correct. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, and we, we've talked about that at other, other venues where, you know, too much around root flares of trees causes stress. Crowns of perennials and annuals causes stress. Um, I've even seen and have done personally, I've burnt plants with uh, mulch that's too fresh, stacked too high against tender plants. Um, I learned that valuable lesson uh, many, many years ago um, as an intern at a, at a job I had. So, you know, like most things in life, all things in, in moderation and, and, and mulch is, is definitely yeah. that. Um, a good organic composty something is, is what we recommend to people. Wood chips and compost mixed together. That's, that's, the, that's the gold standard for, for mulches that, that we found. From a weed control perspective, it doesn't matter no. which mulch it is. All you're doing is excluding light. So for, for weed control, you want something that, that 
covers the ground with a, a good layer. And there's actually been research done on yep. this. How, de how deep a <coughs> layer do you really need? Uh, you know, two to three inches is the bare minimum. Yep. Four inches would be the, the ideal. Any more than that, and you actually start creating an environment where the weeds are growing in the mulch layer. Because at the very base of that mulch, at the, the interface with the soil, there's going to be a, a wet zone and weeds will just grow in there. So, I, you know, you drive around, you see those trees with the volcanoes and yeah. mulches piled up around it. It's not good for the trees no. and, the, and the weeds are just gonna grow in the mulch. Yeah, it's a whole horizon is developed both for the weeds and for tree roots in, yeah. in some cases. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and the other thing, it, it doesn't happen often, but it, it happened in my, in my own landscape. <laughs> it's like, do what I say, not what I do. Um, I, I was growing, I, in one of my gardens, the soil was, was sort of a heavy clay, and I had some, uh, some rhododendron and some azaleas in there, and these are shallow-rooted plants and I had mulched and I had top dressed the mulch and several, after several years, uh, I, was, I was spraying some weeds with an herbicide and then I had herbicide injury on those shrubs. And I'm like, hmm, I know I did not spray those plants. <laughs> I'm pretty good at what I do. And I know I did not spray those plants. And then I, I went out and I looked carefully. Of course, I took pictures of the injury because it was a photo op. Absolutely. And, but I, I raked back that mulch. And what I found were the, the roots of the shrubs were all in the mulch. They, were, they, they need to breathe. And so uh, you can get situations where you can get root uptake of herbicides yeah. applied for, for weed control in mulch landscape beds. So it's just something to be aware of on, on really sandy soils yes. or on heavy clay soils uh, where the plant roots then start growing in mulch instead of the soil. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, I've, and I've mentioned uh, here several times too um, in, in these discussions about timing of herbicide. Um, a lot of them can volatize. You mentioned we were having a separate conversation about greenhouse weed control. And volatization is crucial in those environments because it's enclosed. But in the landscape, it's important because some chemicals at a certain temperature will volatize. That means they turn into gas and the gases float around and that can go into your tree canopy, it can go into your shrub layer. So um, the, the thing that we really try to drive home with any kind of chemical control is read the label. Um, look at the timing for that, the rates, more isn't necessarily better. All those types of things are kind of the, the, the take home messages. Um, the, the other thing that we've talked about with chemical controls is is wearing the proper, uh, proper uh, protective equipment. Mm -hmm. um, nitro gloves at a, at a minimum. Um, I always tell people to put glasses on because stuff can splash into your face. Um, you know, we go to the extent of wearing sometimes Tyvek, mostly because we don't want to get any, any chemicals on our clothing that we're working in, but all that information is found on the label. If you don't want to do that, look it up online and you can have a televised version of the same information. All that stuff is, is out there. Um, it might be easier to read from that environment. But that's, that's kind of the thing that we really want people to pay attention to. The other thing that yeah. ties into that that we've, go ahead. Yeah, I just would like to add one other thing there is the labels are, are very specific about yes. what safety uh, equipment or PPE, personal yep. protective equipment you're supposed to be wearing. Um, but I also want everybody to, you know, use some common sense as well. <laughs> So, for example, you know, if you're going to spray Roundup or glyphosate, if you're going to spray glyphosate, the required PPE is long pants, shoes, and socks. Simple. So, are these going to be okay? Long pants, shoes, and socks? According to the label, it is, you know, okay, but these are not waterproof. And in fact, if I happen to get a little spray on these boots, it's going to soak in 
That's not good. Leather shoes. Leather is not waterproof. Mm. Okay? Your Crocs. Even if you're wearing socks with them, that is not okay for spraying any pesticides. All right? <laughs> so, so use a little common sense. You're spraying, you know, what, it doesn't really matter what pesticide you're spraying. Okay, safety. I advise people to wear rubber boots. Most people that garden have them. Most people that garden put, have some put them on. boots. Put your gum boots on. Put them on. Uh, and rinse them off when you're done. Correct. Uh, and wear rubber gloves. I wear nitrile gloves because nitrile gloves are chemical resist or repellent uh, as opposed to latex gloves. Um, and you can pick those up at, at almost any garden center or pharmacy. Yes. Look in the uh, sort of uh, uh, home first aid supplies, you can find nitrile gloves there. Uh, so I advise you just, you know, even you, you look at the label to see what's, what's required, but also use some common sense yep. there uh, about what is a, you know, proper shoes. And if, even if it doesn't say you need gloves, go ahead and wear gloves. Yeah. The other thing that ties into that is the chemical versus organic um, herbicides. And I get asked those questions all the time about using things like uh, vinegar or uh, propane is one that people like to use because it's a lot of fun to fire up that torch and, and blast things. Flame um, weeding. Flame fun weeding. Fun and effective. Fun and effective <laughs> and a little bit dangerous. Um, I, I've seen people in my neighborhood with uh, pots of boiling water and, and uh, getting the weeds in the cracks of the sidewalk with that kind of stuff. Talk a little bit about your experience. Sure. They've heard me talk about these things. Okay. What's, what's your experience with the, the organics? Well, I mean, organic, uh, there are a lot of organic and natural products out there on the market uh, that work. And uh, most of the products that are available are going to be uh, either a vinegar or a vinegar mixed with a natural oil or soap, uh, or just the, the, the a, a natural acid yeah. like citric or yep. caparillic acid. Uh, often mixed with some kind of natural soap or oil, or just some uh, oily, natural oils can be phytotoxic as well. Yeah. Think of your horticultural oils that you mix to spray for insect control, you know, and, and they're very specific. You mix it with, and I'm not an entomologist, so this is not a recommendation. This is just for example, if it says mix it, you know, 2% two, two in water, for a uh, horticultural oil spray. It, imagine if you did a 20% solution of that, it would burn the foliage, right? And maybe you. And maybe you too. So this is a good, that's a good segue into natural doesn't mean safe. Right. The vinegar that we use for killing weeds is a much higher percent acetic acid than your household vinegar. Household vinegar runs around 5% yep. acetic acid. Okay, yeah, sure, we can take a teaspoon of that uh, every day, uh, pickle juice to- Good, for, good, I, good I, for healthy bellies. That's what I hear. That's what I hear, I don't, yeah. I don't tried it. I haven't tried it either, but I'd that's what I understand, and I've you know, heard on NPR that it actually worked. Right? I like it in my barbecue sauce. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you on that, not a tomato sauce kind of guy. We just lost half of our audience. Sorry about <laughs> that, sorry. I like them okay. both. Uh, rewind, them back. We'll, we'll, we'll put in a Lexington style comment later. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, so, so your household vinegar is five top 7% uh, acetic acid. For killing weeds, you want 10% acetic acid or more, 10 to 15%. So that's why you see horticultural vinegars uh, available for controlling weeds. Now, when you start getting your acid content up that much, and then you mix a natural oil or soap with it, these things are not safe for handling. You need to wear rubber gloves. You need to wear eye protection, yes. And it says so on the label that these things can cause severe eye injury um, and can cause skin irritation. 
So yes, these are natural products. And once they're out in the environment, they're breaking down to natural products and they're perfectly safe in the environment. But when you're handling them, please wear safety equipment, okay? Because, and, and be very cautious about any spray mist that you, you have from that, breathing it, getting in your eyes. It Splashing can, back. Splashing back on you. It can, it can cause skin irritation. It can cause severe eye damage, okay? So natural products, so do, do they work? Yes, they do. All of those natural herbicides um, are contact action. They burn the foliage of whatever you contact with the spray, but they don't translocate, they're not systemic. So if you've got a large annual weed, it'll burn the foliage off, but then it'll re-sprout. If you've got a perennial like our nut sedge, it'll burn the foliage but then it's not gonna get down to the, to the rhizome or the root, and it's just gonna re-sprout and come right back. Just makes it mad. It, but if you come back and do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again, you can exhaust that root system. So, you know, I think, you know, the, the, there's a lot of information on the internet that that hypes up these natural products and makes them seem better than they are. And then there is also some other information on the internet that talks about them not being very good at all and they're not as good as the chemical herbicides, particularly on, on perennial weeds. And in my mind, the real truth is somewhere in between, okay? Yep. They do work. And if you want to use a natural product or organic product for weed control, just be prepared that it's only going to burn the foliage you see and that that plant will grow back very quickly and you just need to go after it again and, and be persistent. Now, if you want to be a little more effective with your weed control, then we do have chemical herbicides uh, that and, and chemical herbicides, we have lots of different products on the market. Okay, we have, what we've been talking about here is we is post-emergence weed control. So after the weeds are up and growing, post-emergence, we have uh, the vinegar is a post-emergence, uh, non-selective product. In other words, non-selective, it burns almost any foliage that it contacts. So any plant you spray it on, it's going to affect, affect it. We have herbicides like that, that are non-selective. They control most any plant that you spray it on. And we have herbicides that are contact action, like the vinegar. So uh, one that is widely available in a lot of uh, mixtures for homeowner use is Diquat. Mm -hmm. It is a contact action, works like the vinegar, but a little bit better. Uh, at, at contact action, burning the weeds back. But when you have a perennial weed, like the nutsedge, what you really want to do is get the herbicide down into the root and kill that rhizome. Then you want what we call a systemic herbicide, something that translocates from the leaves, and goes down into the roots. And that is our most, the, the most widely used example of that is glyphosate, okay. I don't think we have the time to go into the whole question and debate about glyphosate toxicology, but l let me just, just summarize it uh, here, and, um, and maybe that's a subject that people are very interested in. We, we have some recorded, I have some recorded lectures where we talk, to, we talk about this. Yep. Um, the controversy goes back to uh, a report by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Okay, and this is a, a division of the World Health Organization, a very reputable organization that does really good work and really good research. And some of my colleagues, you know, criticize their report, um, but I'm not in that camp. I think the report was very good. Their report concluded that glyphosate is a probable human carcinogen. 
Okay. But what we what people often forget is what the IARC is the acronym for that organization. What they do is called a hazard assessment. What our regulatory agencies do is called a risk assessment. Okay. So what is risk? Risk is hazard times exposure. So the IARC report doesn't, doesn't assess what, what the likelihood that you're going to get a concentration of glyphosate that could cause this. They just ask the question, could glyphosate at some level cause it? And they, in their own report, they say, yes, it needed to reach this particular concentration in order to see the results. And below that concentration, you did not see that result. But because they found it at that higher concentration, it is categorized as probable carcinogen. Okay. But the likelihood of your exposure is what the regulatory agencies like EPA consider. Right. Um, there have been multiple lawsuits related to this. Most any gardener knows this already. Uh, what hits the news are three lawsuits where the, it, the ruling came against the manufacturer of glyphosate. What you don't hear about are the other two more recent lawsuits where they found in favor of the manufacturer of glyphosate and against the plaintiffs. Okay, and now everything is, is being reevaluated and on appeal, and so we don't really know how that's going to turn out. But bottom line, if you as a gardener would prefer not to use glyphosate, there are things out there that you can do. First and foremost, the sanitation, Mulch. mulching. So you don't have to get out there and spray as much. You can use the vinegar, you can use the clove oil products, you can, there are lots of different materials available to you. Just be aware that those products are going to be contact action, not systemic. We do have also pre-emergent herbicides. These are herbicides that you put down before the seeds germinate to control annual weeds coming from seed, okay? Most most gardeners are familiar with the standard lawn care practice of putting down a pre-emergence herbicide uh, in late winter to control your crabgrass and keep your crabgrass from germinating in the lawn. Well, the same principle applies in landscape beds as well. We have products that you can use in that way. You can put down a pre-emergence herbicide in early, early spring uh, and then come uh, with a second application in early summer, and then you could do a third application in One, September to control to the winter weeds. So you're going after that, those life cycles. Your summer life cycle, they're gonna be germinating now, right? So you need your pre-emergence before they came up, right? So we're a little late on that, okay? But you can start thinking about, okay, for fall, how many of you have a pansy bed right now that's full of chickweed? <laughs> Almost every gardener does, right? Yes. Okay, that's easily preventable. In the fall, when you plant your pansy beds, there are pre-emergence herbicides that you can sprinkle on after you've planted your pansy that will keep those winter annuals from coming in, keep the chickweed out. Okay, so again, not every gardener wants to do that, but there are things like that that are available uh, for use in, in gardens. You, of course, have to follow label directions. You want to be very cautious because um, just because this particular herbicide can be used on pansies doesn't necessarily mean you can use it on begonias in the spring. Right. You, and that kind of detailed information is actually, I've compiled that in some uh, fact sheets and uh, and tables of information, but again, probably for the for most gardeners, the best thing to do is talk to your local county agent for guidance, and the county agent can access all of those tables and information that I put on my website. You can access it too; um, it's it's all freely available on my website, but um, it can be a little overwhelming when you look at those it's a multiple ta uh, pages of tables. It's, uh, it's yeah. it can it can be a lot. Yeah. Are we in a place where we need to do questions? Yeah, we can do questions. Okay. For sure. Okay. So we did have a couple of people asking questions about Japanese stilt grass and Ooh, what's good the best way to approach controlling that. 
Japanese stilt grass. That is one that ha is evolved to germinate and grow through mulches. So uh, think of if you see it where you see it in the uh, forest, um, it produces its own thick layer of straw mulch every year yeah. and, it's a, and it has evolved so it can just grow right through that. Now mulches do help, mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're not going to, uh, to stop it completely. All right, so <clears throat> stilt grass germinates very early. It was already germinated the third week of February in my yard. So it, it germinates early and uh, it, its life cycle is a summer annual, much like crabgrass, okay? But crabgrass germinates a little bit later. So sometimes if, you, if you're out there, you know, putting a pre-emergence herbicide on for crabgrass control, you might miss your stilt grass because it came up two weeks prior. Uh, but uh, if you think about stilt grass like, it, like crabgrass, you control stilt grass in almost the same ways that you control crabgrass. There is one important difference, and that is uh, the stilt grass does not flower until very late in the season. Okay, so you're looking at, you know, between now and September, you need to control it before it goes to seed. Sanitation is really important for stilt grass management because the seed really do not last in the soil that long. Our research right here in North Carolina shows that if you control that stilt grass three years in a row, you'll deplete the soil seed bank by over 99%. Now, yes, do some seed last longer than that? Of course they do. They, you know, most plants will have some small percentage of their seeds that can last more than 10 years in the soil. But if you've got 99 or greater percent loss of that seed bank, then you're not dealing with very many coming up the next year. So control it before it goes to seed. How do you do that? Anything that controls crabgrass will control it. So we have herbicides that control crabgrass. We have you know, herbicides that you, you can control crabgrass or stilt grass. You can spray these herbicides right over the top of most of your landscape ornamentals, okay? And we have, there are other herbicides that you can use in turf to control it in turf. But if you've got it in turf, what you really wanna think about is, do you have the right species of turf for this site? Are you mowing properly? You, because stilt grass is not an aggressive grass in a healthy turf. So a healthy turf should exclude stilt grass. Uh, chances are the area is a little shady. It's um, become a bad woodland weed. Mm. Yes. And it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, uh, it's relatively easy to pull out. Mm -hmm. And again, you break up that, that life cycle of allowing it to flower and produce the seed. It comes up really, really easy. Yep. A lot of people, you know, it's actually an attractive weed. Mm -hmm. um, it looks good, but it, it's kind of a, a, a hidden villain because it, chokes everything out that, sh that should be there um, in our natural landscapes. Yeah. And by the time you notice it, it's really gotten its legs underneath it and is, is running in all directions. Um, mechanically, it's pretty easy to, to, to pull out, but chemically, it's a, it's a, it's a, fast, it's a fast knockdown with it, in, yeah. my, in my experience. Yes, yeah, it's, once you decide to, to control it, uh, it's fairly easy to control. Uh, it's it's well controlled by flame weeding, yeah. um, but remember where it is. It's usually <laughs> in a woodland area with lots of other flammable things nearby. Pine needles. Yep. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so flame weeding does work, but be very cautious. <laughs> um, steam weeding yes. works, and without the flame, but. You know, that's a very expensive system. Steam weeding is yep. something that I, I've seen a lot of um, going to trade shows and things. There's always somebody that will bring that up. And it's used in the nursery trade to, to some effect, um, commercially a little bit. Um, I don't think it's going to trickle down to the home, the home landscape use, but it's, it's really yep. effect orchards, vineyards, I've seen it used. Um, but it's, it's a really interesting way to, to control weeds. Yeah. yeah. 
like I said, it does work. It's just a very, it's very expensive equipment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we're, not and, we're not quite there yet. Right. There, there isn't a, a real viable small homeowner type unit at, at this stage. Okay. So we got a question for Joe. Somebody's asking, what is your opinion on corn gluten meal as a pre-emergent? Corn gluten meal is not an effective pre-emergence cool. uh, <laughs> weed control product. Um, it does have herbicidal uh, compounds in it, but they are simple uh, molecules that break down very rapidly mm -hmm. in our environment. So we found that it actually releases nitrogen and feeds the, the summer weeds. But we also did trials in the fall when we were seeding um, our, our uh, turf grass, uh, seeding a, a, a tall fescue turf. We, we used corn gluten in those situations more as an organic fertilizer. Mm. And we did decrease the amount of um, of winter annual broadleaf weeds there. And we attribute that primarily to the fertility response. Huh. But there, it is true, there is a herbicidal compound in corn gluten. It just breaks down very rapidly in our environment and doesn't, doesn't hold the weeds back. No I, I used it at a garden and the, the take home for us was that it drove mice and rats absolutely bonkers hmm. because they i mean they we had um we we bought it to use in a turf grass situation and had it staged somewhere for a couple of weeks when we came back it had been completely overwhelmed by by rodents um they got in the bags i mean most of it had been completely destroyed and we tried it again and in the, in the, in staged it someplace else and the same thing happened there's something wow. in that it's like it's called corn. Uh, it's called corn. <laughs> it's called corn. Um, but it was like yeah. it was like crack cocaine for the the, the mice and the, the rodents. Yeah. On a small scale, uh, maybe. But that's my same experience with yeah. with us. I would say it. Corn gluten is a good organic fertilizer. Yes. Right. <laughs> and think of it in that way. And if you get a little bit of weed control bonus out of that, then then you know, bonus, you know, but don't count on it for pre-emergence weed control. All right. The yeah. next question isn't so much of a question as it is uh, an exclamation. I just love how much feeling they put into such a concise, basically, smilax. Smilax. <laughs> Smile and relax. Yes. Although they did later ask an actual question. Yeah. Is there a chemical that will kill smilax or am I doomed to digging it up forever? Um, you're doomed. <laughs> it's a, it's got such a glossy, yeah. waxy leaf. It's hard for anything to, to stay on it. Yeah. We, we tried uh, different surfactants, things to try to keep the chemical on the leaf longer and it really didn't uh, have any effect. I, I mean, I, yeah. don't, I don't consider that a garden weed. Um, that's like oh. a woodland? No, does it no. Get into the gardens? It gets in gardens in a big way. And, yeah. and you can imagine, you know, what, where it usually it's it's growing up underneath the canopy that's so, true. so it comes up right at the base and it, and you see it when it comes out the top of the shrub hollies it likes hollies yeah and yeah. and then and it's growing right down there in the root flare yeah and so digging it up is mm. is difficult a lot of times yeah. and, and it has a real woody uh thorny burl so this is another one. You mentioned cutting it off, cutting it off. People yeah. cut this off and cut this off and cut this off. That just, the Bulks burl gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so the most effective way that I've found of controlling Smilax is to dig that burl out uh, physically. But if you can't do that, uh, if like it's growing right underneath the, uh, the tree and you really can't get in there or it's in a ground cover and you, you know, you just don't want to destroy your ground cover to get rid of this one weed. Uh, there are a couple of things, okay? It is an evergreen, right? And if you think about our, our herbicide that we normally would use to kill uh, perennial weeds in landscapes, glyphosate, uh, for deciduous vines like um, porcelain, well, yeah, porcelain berry, uh, or uh, wisteria, mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I brought brought some props here. Right? Porcelain <laughs> berry. This is a deciduous vine. And what do plants do to get ready for winter? A deciduous plant like this gets ready for winter by translocating all of their sugars and amino acids that are in the leaves. They go right into the stem and go down into the stem and the roots for winter. So if we spray glyphosate on this, when that plant is translocating everything down to the roots, it's gonna work better, right? Smilax is an evergreen. So how does an evergreen get ready for winter? Remember, it's going to try to keep that leaf. It's going to try to keep that leaf alive all winter long. To keep it from freezing, what does it do? It, it keeps all the sugars. It concentrates all these sugars in the leaf. So if we spray Smilax in, in late summer and the fall, um, the glyphosate's not leaving the leaf. It's just, if, even if it gets in, right. right, it's got a big wax. By that time of year, the wax coating is thick and the glyphosate doesn't really get in very well. But even if we could get it in, the, uh, it just stays in the leaf and doesn't go anywhere. So when do you do this for an evergreen? It's in the spring when it's pushing some new growth. And what's happening is all those old leaves from last year are pushing all of those sugars out of the leaves to the growing points, both the top and the roots, to grow more. So Smilax work, you know, glyphosate will work better on Smilax in the springtime than in the fall. Okay, the rest of the, in the summer, it's just gonna take the top off, you know, a little bit. So how do you get it on there? One way is to, to use a wiper, hmm. you know, Brush where you, you just sort of take a, take a concentrated solution, uh, uh, one part uh, your glyphosate material, two parts water, and you just wipe, you, you wipe it on, not with your hand, obviously, uh, but uh, with, a, uh, with a wiper device. And you can look online for, there are all kinds of things that you can use to wipe these things on. Uh, but another way to go after these the vines or any woody uh, sort of shrub or, or tree sapling that's in a landscape bed is a, a cut stem treatment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you find, you know, you trace it back where it's going into the soil and you make a nice, clean, fresh cut. And then you, you either dab or spray uh, the freshly cut stem with the herbicide. And you can use glyphosate, you can use brush killers that contain triclopyr. Um, so there are lots of products uh, that are on the market, sometimes sold as, as brush killer mm -hmm. or, or poison ivy and brush control yep. or poison ivy killer. Uh, but those, those products will work on that cut stem treatment, okay? Uh, and that's the way I, I go after, um, you know, Smilax or other woody vines that are growing up in landscape beds. English ivy. Uh, mm. Now, English ivy, uh, I would, you know, I actually did research on this about uh, 38 years ago. Um, and th things haven't changed much. English ivy is still a, a, a really can be very invasive. It can be a beautiful shade ground cover or it can be an invasive weed. Um, it is an evergreen. The best time to control it with, with a glyphosate application is in the spring when it has two to four new leaves. Okay, and then you come back about six weeks later with a second application and we were you know, typically get over 90% control. Do that two years in a row. With any perennial weed, particularly the woody weeds, persistence pays off. I was just out trying to kill some bamboo yesterday. Mm. Now that is, for the audience, just say no to bamboo. <laughs> it is a terrible, terrible weed in yes. landscapes. Yeah. Okay. And when your neighbor plants some, you know, uh, be ready because it, 
It's coming and knocking. It's gonna come. And I have not seen a containment system yet that truly no. was able to contain bamboo over the long run. So the thing with bamboo is once it's established, it grows very, very rapidly. And so, you know, one day it's not there, the next day you've got this 10 foot uh, calm coming out of the ground. And so what do you do about that? It's usually coming up in, in amongst desirable plants. Again, I use the cut stem method, but a little bit modified. Uh, a bamboo plant, you know, has nodes and in between those nodes, in the center of that is a hollow chamber. What I like to do is around close to the ground, I cut it in between those nodes and then put the glyphosate solution right into that chamber. Hmm. It's selective. You know, you can do this right near your other plants because you're not spraying, you're just, you know, you know, literally pouring it into that open chamber. And this will absorb into that stem and it will translocate and get down into the rhizome. Now, bam it's not gonna kill a big patch of bamboo like that, but you can keep it at bay. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, we're getting, uh, we're running a little bit long right now, so I think we'll just do one more question. People are, you've used the word sanitation quite a bit, and yeah. some people are asking for a bit of clarification on that. Could you just say what sanitation with regards to weeds is? Oh yeah, baking soda does a great job cleaning the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Okay, baking soda is not an herbicide. It doesn't control weeds. It might keep the, clean, the leaves nice and clean, but when I'm talking about sanitation, it's really about uh, removing the weeds before they can go to seed. And, you know, don't reintroduce the weeds. So when you pull those weeds, what do you do with them? Okay, do you just toss them over your shoulder? When you're out there hoeing, do you just hoe the weeds and leave them there in the garden? Well, if you pull up the uh, this chickweed, and you leave it there. Sure, the plant itself is going to decompose, it's gonna dry up and decompose, but while it's doing that, it's putting all the energy it has into the seeds, and those seeds are gonna drop. So part of sanitation is get the weeds out of there. Okay, it's okay to put them in your compost heap as long as you're composting properly, okay? But if, you're, if you just have a pile of debris there, and it's not truly composting, then you can spread weed seeds with that, okay? Sanitation also, make sure you don't have perennial weeds like Bermuda grass growing into your, your compost pile. Bermuda grass loves growing compost, right? So you gotta keep the Bermuda grass out of there. Otherwise, when you go get compost to put in your vegetable garden, you're planting Bermuda grass. So that's part of sanitation. So it's anything that you do to keep the weeds from reproducing, from spreading, and that can be hand weeding and pulling it out. It can be, you know, con weed control with herbicides when they're young before they can go to seed. So just, you know, again, keeping that weed from spreading and making babies. Awesome. When you, when you mow your grass, it's another kind of sanitation thing especially if you have Bermuda grass, don't have the shoots your mower shooting those mm -hmm. little pieces of Bermuda into your beds. <laughs> you know, turn, turn around and go the other way. You talked about common sense. It all comes back to that. <laughs> Use a mulching mower, even or, or, better. Or, yeah, or a rear discharge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome, okay. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So thank you so much, Joe, for coming out here and talking with us about weeds. It was exceedingly informative, for <laughs> well, sure. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Greg, for leading this conversation for us. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. All right, so we will be back next week, next Wednesday at three o'clock. Uh, it'll be the first week of May. So we will be doing May God. gardening tasks and Greg will be here for that as well. How is that possible? That's May. No kidding. Time. <laughs> what, a, what a nebulous thing. Anyway, we'll see y'all next week. Y'all take care. <laughs>